All right. Please allow me to open us in prayer. God, thank you so much for this day. And thank you for your goodness and for your love. And thank you that you are at work in your people to will and to do according to good pleasure. And thank you, Lord, that you have invited us to be about the task of sharing your love with people around us, with the world. And God, as we talk a little bit more about that tonight, I pray that you will uh, guide this time, that your spirit will fill this place, and that you will instruct us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Welcome back. And it's good to have each of you here in session five of tonight's uh, seminar. we got one week left. And uh, toward the end of the seminar, I'll tell you a little bit about what's next after uh, this a little bit. But tonight, what I want us to do is focus a little bit on, uh, we've, if you recall, uh, week one, we talked about what is evangelism. We went into this pure doctrinal understanding of what evangelism was. And then uh, in week two, we took a look at spiritual disciplines and how we can prepare ourselves as Christians to be about the work that God has for us. And then in session three, uh, we, we took a look at corporate prayer, how we can pray uh, for one another in the task. And last week, we finally talked about some methods of uh, how to do evangelism. How many of you guys uh, worked on your testimony? Anybody work on their testimony a little bit? Did you work Obadiah in? I did not. No. You did not. Yeah, that one verse I wanted to work it. Yeah, you need to work over diet and into that. There's a sidebar conversation on that that we'll fill you in on later. And we also talked about the Roman road. Anybody working on those verses at all? Read through them. Uh, I think you'll find some real value in those. Uh, yesterday I used a few of them in the sermon. I mean, you're not like, that's a Roman road verse. I don't know if you did that or not. Tonight, though, what I want us to focus a little bit on is how relationships matter in evangelism. And one thing that I hope that you've gotten out of this, and I've said this over and over, and that is it's important for a variety of people to be involved in the task of witnessing. It's important for a variety of uh, individuals, career fields, genders, races, age, to be involved in evangelism. So... If you haven't gotten caught on to that yet, uh, what I'm about to do is I'm about to show you a pie chart, which I love pie. They don't embrace pie in, in Korea, but I love pie, uh, so I love pie charts. And this pie chart will demonstrate to you why it is important for us to be involved in evangelism. Uh, this big orange part, by the way, and this was a study uh, that was conducted uh, several years ago. I got this from uh, Christian Military Fellowships website from their materials that they have online. And it was a study of, they, they polled people and they said, uh, who was instrumental in you coming to Christ? Who do you give credit or what do you give credit to uh, for you uh, coming to Christ? One thing I find is interesting here is gospel tracts on a windshield are not on there, by the way. Uh, and they're nowhere to be found on there. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen people do that. I don't know it. I you know, you can't say the Holy Spirit can't use them, but I don't know anybody that's ever come to Christ through a gospel track on a windshield. Uh, I shared my testimony with you last week. Evangelistic Crusade, or TV show, was the means by which I came to Christ. Smallest sliver up here. It does happen. But the biggest, over three quarters, in fact, 78% uh, of Christians surveyed in that study came to Christ as a result of a witness of a friend or a relative. So that is staggering, isn't it? It is staggering that the uh, that relationships seem to be so instrumental in people coming to Christ. Uh, pastor was second, but pastor was only 6%. So if you're inclined to say, well, let's leave it to the professionals, let's leave it to the, to the uh, super hired holy men and women to you know, lead people to Christ, only 6% of people uh, come to Christ uh, through them. Sunday school, 5%. Uh, church service or program, 3%. Walk in off the street. And I find this one funny because I pastored a church in Selma, California. And it was in a downtown area. Anybody ever been to Selma? It's about 20 miles south of Fresno. It's the raisin capital of the world. Like 95% of the U.S. raisin crop is grown within 8 miles of downtown Selma. They have a raisin festival. I mean, everything's raisin. And the names of everything's raisin. Uh, any rate. We were in a downtown area, and the church that I pastored expected me to be available for office hours in case somebody wanted to walk in and come to Christ. Well, it, 
it never happened. People just didn't walk in and, and come to Christ. And so I, uh, I played their game for a little bit. And after about three months, I said, hey, uh, you don't hang out at the coffee shop. Get coffee, meet people. Seemed pretty good. And that actually seemed to be more effective. Uh, but people walking off the street, uh, special need, 2%. And then personal visitation, 2%. And, uh, you know, a lot of churches are big into going and knocking on doors. Only about 2% of people uh, came to Christ as a result of that. Uh, people nowadays really don't want people coming over to their house quite as much. They don't trust people. They feel like it's unsafe. Uh, if you ever come over to my house, understand it's not visitor ready. <laughs> so, uh, um, and, and I imagine that that resonates with many people as well. So, 78% of people said that, they that a relationship with a friend or a relative or a co-worker was instrumental in them coming to Christ. So, it's important that we have a variety of people involved in the task of sharing Christ in the task of evangelism. Yes, sir? Seems like all of our time, money, and resources go to that smaller piece. Bingo! It really does, doesn't it? Uh, that is a very good point. That's one I hadn't considered, but I think you're spot on there. Uh, you know, when you consider uh, how much it cost to... I mean, several years ago, again, while I was pastoring, and we had, we had Billy Graham come to Fresno, and we, we rented, they rented Bulldog Stadium. Fresno State. And it happened to be Fresno was number six in the nation so that at the time. And, and Trent Dilfer was the quarterback. I mean, it was a real uh, big draw there. And, and uh, I, I was actually on the committee that uh, oversaw uh, the planning and the amount of money that it costs. And, and understand, Billy Graham didn't get a, a red cent from this. The amount of money was staggering that it cost. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, if one soul came to Christ as a result, it was worth it. But, you, you know, one half percent. <laughs> so that is an excellent point. Thank you for seeing that. Absolutely. And so, it's very important. So, as we consider that, uh, as I've shared with you a little bit about the diffusion of innovation theory, that's a basis for a lot of the research that I did. Again, it's a theory that uh, studies how people uh, adopt innovations, how people adopt new ideas. And, and two characteristics that I want us to focus on in considering how we can uh, evangelize through the relationships we have in our life are uh, two, two of uh, Dr. Everett Rogers, the, the, the originator, the, the founder of Diffusion of Innovation Theory, uh, cites two uh, characteristics relative to the innovation element, and that is compatibility and observability. And these two elements are present in relationship evangelism. So let's take a look at them. Uh, compatibility. Is the gospel compatible? On an individual level, uh, the gospel is compatible to, to everyone. Does, does God love everybody? Do we believe God loves everybody? So, you know, and, and God doesn't choose. We read in the scriptures, if you recall, uh, in the early church. Remember uh, Peter? He had that, that vision of God lowering down the sheep from heaven. And it says there was all kinds of animals in it that he, he saw was unclean. And the Spirit said, rise, kill, and eat. He said, no, Lord, nothing unclean has touched my lips. I'm convinced there was some bacon. There was a BLT in that. Like, that's what I'm convinced. There was a BLT in there. And uh, God rebuked him and said, don't call clean what God has made unclean. And, and from that, and then next thing you know, uh, Cornelius' servants knock on the door. And he goes with them and he realizes, wait a minute, this gospel really is for everyone. And so on an individual level, it's completely compatible with everyone. It's effectual for all who believe. Uh, there's nobody who believes and is not saved. If you believe, you're saved. If you don't believe, you're not saved. Uh, and, and there was a key moment within the history of the church, and it was actually right after that, that story, uh, not long after that story, uh, when... Uh, the, the leaders of the church at Jerusalem brought in Peter and they brought in the apostles and uh, they wanted to talk about this because there were some who believed, wait a minute, you've got to become a Jew to become a Christian. And they were teaching that you had to be circumcised and, and, and follow the, the, the Jewish law. And, and so they sat down and they talked about these things. And 
uh, they decided uh, that they weren't going to do that to the Gentiles. It was a burden that they themselves couldn't bear. It was a burden that did not uh, lead to salvation. Uh, they decided to um, ask them to refrain from uh, sexual immorality and, and meat sacrifice to idols and blood, sexual immorality. I mean, for obvious reasons, it's, it, it breaks the heart of God. Uh, the meat sacrifice to idols because it, it, it appears to associate with idol worship. And the blood part does as well. So uh, they, they essentially decide, you know, we're not going to make the Gentiles become Jews to become Christians. And in doing so, they, uh, by easing that burden, Christianity became that much more compatible with uh, individuals on an individual level. But then on a societal level, it's kind of interesting, uh, the demands of the gospel may not be so compatible with society. And uh, particularly when we look at our own nation and, and some of the things that are going on. I mean, I, uh, I, I'm stepping, in, stepping on thin ice here when I'm candid to say that, uh, you know, our nation has embraced some ideas and some values that are contrary to Scripture. You know, in, in the chaplain corps, for example, you know, there's a great deal of pressure on us. We all know what June is. It's, it's Pride Month. And there have been requests for us to be involved in Pride Month, and we have declined them uh, for scriptural reasons. So far, we haven't gotten any pushback, but that could happen at some point. And the same could happen for, for you. The, you know, our society could uh, embrace values that, uh, that, that are contrary to scriptural values. And historically, that has happened. Uh, in, in many uh, societies as well. So uh, we are, to, to uh, paraphrase uh, the, the Old Testament, we are speckled birds to a degree. We really are. Uh, we are not always going to fit in in the societies we have. Even here at Coonsign, you know, uh, there's a lot of things. It's been my observation in my short time here at Coonsign that uh, this is a divorce factory. <laughs> And it's an alcoholic factory. And uh, those, and it's largely because of behaviors, and I'm not, I'm not knocking drinking, what I'm knocking here is drunkenness. There are behaviors that are spoken against in Scripture. And uh, you, some of you may have found that uh, with, in your squadrons where people want you to, inv you know, everybody's involved in this, and you're, you're saying, well, wait a minute. The Word of God says they shouldn't be involved in that. It's going to put you at odds. Now, Jesus foretold this. He told us it was going to happen. Uh, in fact, he experienced it, as did the, the early church. And, it, and even the early Christians, they were uh, ultimately persecuted because they refused to say that Caesar was Lord. Uh, their faith put them at odds with the very Roman culture. The complete irony of that was it was the Roman culture that actually made it easier for them to spread the gospel. And so Rome, when they wouldn't bow to Caesar, started persecuting them. And, and as I pointed out in yesterday's sermon, the persecution just seemed to spread the gospel. In fact, one of the early church fathers made the comment that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And so a uh, so couple ironies. Number one, Rome made it easier for them to spread the gospel. And then secondly... When they started being persecuted, people took note and it drew attention to Christians and they grew even more. So what Rome tried to destroy blossomed. And now, and then Rome fell and guess what was still alive? The church. And so uh, people all over the world have been persecuted for adhering to values that are contrary to the larger culture they live in. And so I think it's important for those who are practicing evangelism to, to uh, when inviting others to Christ, to help them to understand that they're inviting them to a, a degree of, of incompatibility uh, with, with the world. Now, that said, it is worthy of noting that some people are drawn to incompatibility. Some people are drawn to not doing the same thing everyone else is. And, and I believe uh, part of that could be that rebellious spirit. Uh, honestly, part of it could be the Holy Spirit. Uh, there are some people that uh, they, the world has left them broken. And in fact, we, uh, the chaplains, we see this all the time here at Coon's office. I mentioned the whole divorce factory and drunk factory. We get a lot of people come into our building 
I'm just saying, this, this place is nuts. I'm going nuts. I need something different. And so, don't let the incompatibility with society necessarily, it, it's not a bad thing. It's a very good thing, and it may be the very thing that draws people to Christ. But I think that we, we need to have integrity and make pe sure people know we're not asking them to be like everybody else. We're asking them to be different. So there's compatibility, but then there's also the observability. Up there is a quote from Mahatma Gandhi that breaks my heart every time he reads it. Where he, he, he said to a group of missionaries, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. That quote breaks my heart. And I think what breaks my heart is it's often true. It can often be true. It can often be true that people will claim to be Christians, but their lives do not reflect Christ. Now, the fact is, and I've heard people say, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. The fact is, we all we all do things that are hypocritical all the time, and and, and we all make mistakes. And uh, I I really am not convinced, though, that the world is expecting perfection of us. In fact, some of the greatest opportunities for sharing Christ I've ever had have been when I've messed up, and I've been able to go to them and say, "Yeah, I messed up." It's those it's those humility moments. Uh, sometimes that, that create the greatest moments. But the fact is, you know, many Christians are unabashedly not like Christ. And, and that breaks my heart every time I read that quote. Now, as I mentioned in, in session one, uh, we see in the Old Testament uh, that uh, evangelism is centripetal, centripetal. In other words, it, it, it was drawing people in. It was a come and see mode of evangelism. And a big part of that was uh, the different ways in which people, in which God's people lived. God expected his people to be different. Uh, much of the laws that were, uh, were given were about making a people different from the people around them. Uh, the, the rules as far as how you treat people, even, even things like not uh, making a garment out of cotton and wool, uh, and, and, and that was because that was uh, associated with idolatry. Uh, one of the oddest ones, I don't know, it's several places in Scripture. Everybody read that verse that says, Do not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Uh, anybody ever read that one? It's, it's several places in, in the law, and you read it, it's like, that, That's not a verse I'm going to probably. What's your life verse? You know? <laughs> Uh, it's one of those that if you, you know, write in a card, if you want to have fun with people, you know, look it up. Just the reference, they think, oh, they thought of me, and they look it up. It could be kind of like that. But the reality was that was associated with a, an idolatrous practice among the Canaanites that they were running out, where they would, they would literally boil a young goat in its mother's milk. It wasn't a cooking thing. It was, an, it was, it was a means of sacrifice. And so... Uh, God, in giving his law, wanted to make the people different. He wanted them not to fit in to the culture uh, because the culture was a mess. In the same way, our, our culture's a mess too. And so we see in the Old Testament, God wanted them to honor him as a witness to the nations. And when they didn't do so, he brought punishment. Uh, right now I'm studying through the book of, of Judges with a couple of men here on base. And uh, that's one thing we see in the book of Judges. There's a pattern. The people run away from God. God sends an oppressor. The people cry out. God sends a deliverer. And then wash, rinse, repeat. That seems to be the pattern that happens over and over again. Um, and so it was about honoring God and lifting up his name. And then we look at the early church. The early church was expected to maintain a lifestyle that demonstrated hope to those observing. One of the, in, in Acts chapter 2, it says that the people had all things in common. Now, I've seen people that have used that to try to advocate communism. I would suggest to you that that's not communism, because communism is, is atheistic in nature. And even in communism, you have power. Uh, if you don't believe that, look north. Um, and there's uh, a nation of starving people and one pudgy guy. I mean, it's not, 
it, it's not an equal society. But uh, the reason they did that was because the gospel was at stake. They made a lot of decisions. They, uh, there were those who chose careers based on the gospel. There were those who married based on the gospel. There, there were those who didn't marry uh, based on the gospel. And uh, also, as, as we consider their worship practices, they would, they would choose their worship practices so as not to alienate the people around them or uh, needlessly confuse the people around them. If you read in, in, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, the whole, uh, the whole tongues issue. Which, by the way, we always look, you know, 1 Corinthians 13. That's it. It's everybody's wedding. It was in my wedding. Beautiful passage. 21 years ago this week. Still rocking it. Uh, but really, that, that chapter wasn't about romantic love. That chapter was about God's love and, more importantly, worship. Uh, and, and, and Paul is very careful in there to say you need to practice these, these gifts with some discretion and prudence so you don't confuse people and you don't uh, cause people to say bad things about you. So the early church was very cautious. And even, even now today, um, I, would, I would say that caution and prudence is still very important. Uh, there are certain things that... Uh, that are out there, I would suggest to you, yeah, Scripture doesn't specifically prohibit them, but the Christians should be prayerful in whether or not they should participate. And if they, and if the Holy Spirit gives them freedom, then uh, they should ensure that the Holy Spirit, that they only do so as the Holy Spirit leads. I would say one of them uh, would be alcohol use. You know, of course, Scripture says don't get drunk, but what about a glass of wine? What about a beer? Well, honestly, the answer is you need to talk to the Lord about that. And he needs to give you a clear conscience whether or not you can do that. And then you also need to listen to the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's telling you this situation isn't one you, you should do that in, don't do it. It's not about being legalistic. It's about not needlessly confusing people, not alienating people, not being a stumbling block to people. But ultimately, it's about maintaining a, a lifestyle that demonstrates hope to those who are observing. Again, You've got to pray about these things. Wouldn't it be easier if God just gave us a list? Honestly, it would. Do these things, don't do these things, you're good. God didn't do that because he wants relationship with us. And, and so, but at any rate, we need to display such a lifestyle. But then we see, even in the most adverse circumstances, Christians were expected to be different in order to reflect the image of God. I shared this a couple weeks ago in, in in Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John go to, go to jail for you know, healing a guy in the name of Jesus, and, and, and they're warned not to speak of the name of Jesus again, and they say, judge for yourselves what is better. Uh, we would rather obey God than men, and they're persecuted, and they go back to the believers, and then they all pray for boldness. Uh, I am... Quick to point out to uh, many, I come from a denomination that, that's very patriotic. And uh, a lot of the patriotism comes out of, well, we're patriotic because the, the United States has given us the freedom to worship. Actually, the Holy Spirit's given us the freedom to worship. And the United States has chosen to acknowledge what the Holy Spirit has done in our lives. And, but if the United States chose to no longer acknowledge that, guess what, my brothers and sisters? We still got to get together for worship. It might look different. It might be in somebody's basement. It might be at odd hours. We might all show up at different times, and you know. But but nonetheless, we, we still got to get together and worship because it's still our obligation. And then, uh, but I think really on the observability front, and I point this out: the tight niche nature of military communities increases the importance of observability for Christian airmen. Of course, who's on? You know, anytime you see somebody new, at least me, I see somebody new, I know right away. I've been here two and a half months, I pretty well know everybody that's there. Uh, doesn't mean I know their name, but I at least ways know what they look like. But even, even back at home station, how many of you live on base or near the base? Even, uh, you know, even I, know, I know where you live, and even though you live 10 miles from the base, everybody over there is from the base. I mean, from Muscoota, Illinois, it's... It wouldn't be there if it weren't for the base. Or it might be like a 510-person farming community, like Green Acres or something. But, 
Uh, if you live near the base, everybody knows everybody from the base. You know, we do certain things. I mean, you, you take off the uniform, we all know you're military. And so, we're tight. And I think that increases the importance of observability. It increases the effect when we don't live lives that are not worthy of observance. But when we live out our faith, it actually magnifies the witness we have. So, uh, those of us who are in the military have a, an ideal situation for witnessing uh, where we're at. And we're going to get a little bit more into next week. We're going to talk a little bit about the do's and don'ts in the military. Uh, and I think you'll find them encouraging, by the way. So, compatibility, observability. Now, I want us to uh, just do a breeze through Scripture real quick uh, to see some examples of when relationships have opened the doors uh, for evangelism. Uh, we see Andrew. And every time, you, one thing I love about Andrew is every time you see Andrew, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. Uh, in John chapter 1, we find uh, Andrew uh, meets Jesus. And the first thing he does is he goes and grabs his brother Peter. Okay, so it was a family relationship. Uh, Jesus doesn't meet Andrew before he meets Peter. Of course, Peter uh, was the one, you know, he's the, he's the first one to get it, the first one to realize you are the Christ of God. Uh, when Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church, I know that our Catholic brethren interpret that as Peter. Actually, scripture, in the Greek, it's the confession of faith that he's building his church on, not Peter. But we'll, we'll understand that better by and by. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Peter ends up being the more prominent one. But even though Peter's the more prominent one, who brought Peter to Jesus? It was Andrew. So... Sometimes those behind the scene quieter people make a big difference. Uh, we also see Philip uh, bringing his brother Nathaniel uh, in the same in the same passage right there. Uh, Philip brings his brother Nathaniel to Christ. Very similar uh, situation, and, and Nathaniel was the one who, or his, his friend Nathaniel rather, and, and Nathaniel was the one who said, "Nazareth, can, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth?" And then uh, Jesus says to him, "I saw you when you were standing under the tree." And so um, we find that, that Philip brings his friend Nathaniel. Then in John 4, beautiful story. Uh, if you recall the story, it was, it was the woman at the well where Jesus and his disciples go through Samaria, which no one did in their day. The Jews would go around. If, if they were map questing it, there would be a checkbox, go around Samaria, and that's what they all did. Uh, but... In the story, Jesus talks with this woman, and he, and he tells her everything she ever did. And so she leaves uh, the well, and then she goes and grabs the town people. And the town people all follow, and then they say, we believe now because uh, we came because she, she told us to come, but now we believe because we've seen for ourselves. Uh, God used a Samaritan woman, a woman who was uh, really not uh, of any level of prestige and maybe uh, a level of repute, nonetheless, uses uh, her to, to witness to others and bring them to Jesus. Mark chapter 5, there was a man who, uh, a demon-possessed man uh, from the Gerasenes. And uh, in the story, Jesus casts the demons out. This is the one where uh, he casts them into the pigs, all the demons into the pigs. And I'm thinking, I heard a lot of bacon gone. <laughs> but uh, that's what I get teaching class before dinner. That's what I get. Uh, but at any rate, the man actually wants to go with Jesus, and I can see this, okay? If you, you know, how many of you want to be known as, oh, that, that was that demon-possessed guy? How many of you want to be known as that guy, right? Uh, a lot of people, they want, to, they want to kind of do a geographic start over. And, uh, that's, that happens a lot in the military, you know? So just, there's a lot of people like, I need orders. Yeah. I need orders. I need to get out of there. I'm going to volunteer to go to Korea. I'm going to get away from this problem. Fact is, it usually follows him. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this man he wanted to do a geographic refresh and go with Jesus. And Jesus said, "No, stay here and tell the people what happened to you. I want you to be my evangelist. I want you to be my missionary to these people because they knew you were demon possessed, and they know you aren't now." And so that happened. In Matthew nine, we find that uh, Matthew. And anybody remember what Matthew did for a living? He's a tax collector. That's right. And tax collectors, they were some hated people. 
And the reason was there was a certain amount of money they had to collect, but then they could collect more and the difference they got to keep. You know, I guess a tax collector with integrity basically collected enough to live on, but that wasn't what they did. They, they collected enough. I mean, these were the, uh, I mean, these were the, uh, the Cristal and Bentley and, you know, gold teeth, gray goose people right here. Uh, they were, they, and the people hated them because the people knew that. Well, uh, Jesus uh, tells, tells Matthew um, to, you know, Jesus calls Matthew, and the next thing he does, he invites all his tax collector friends. Yeah, who knows more people who need to know Christ than anybody? People who just came to Christ. Because what happens over time is, and we'll get to that in a little bit, you know, fewer and fewer and fewer people who don't know Christ. And so Matthew did. Then, then Zacchaeus did it. You've heard the story. You know, Zacchaeus was a, a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Yes. Climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And then uh, Jesus said, you come down. I'm going to your house today. Remember that? And then what did he do? He had a dinner party. Again, Zacchaeus was also a tax collector. But he had a dinner party for his friends. Zacchaeus did it too. Um, in Scripture, Jesus was accused of eating with sinners and tax collectors. And in one translation, it says prostitutes there. Uh, the Pharisees meant to say that for, for evil. Uh, but the reality is that was a good thing. Jesus was known for hanging around people that they weren't the clean, polished church folk. Uh, and yet Jesus, we know in Scripture, he, it, he, it was he who knew no sin. So he wasn't defiled by the people, but he hung around them a little bit. He hung around them anyway. As I, as I pointed out yesterday, just because people sin in a way that we find unthinkable doesn't make them untouchable. And then moving forward, uh, the story I told you earlier about Peter having the dream. And then Cornelius, he, he got to speak to Cornelius. And so uh, what, what was interesting about this was Peter traveled with Cornelius' servants and he traveled, and they came to, came to Cornelius' house, and he invited everybody. So Cornelius wasn't one of those guys who just wanted to hear the gospel himself. He brought everybody. And the scripture says his whole ho household got baptized. So Cornelius, as one who hadn't even really come to Christ yet, he hadn't come to Christ yet. God said, the word says he was a God-fearing man. He brought everybody, because there was something they needed to hear. And this is, this is somewhat long right here, but I think it's noteworthy that Paul, Scripture says that Paul had a two-year experience, uh, relationship, if you will, talking with Felix. He was, the, he was the governor of the time, and the Scriptures say that from time to time, uh, he would, uh, Felix would, would send for Paul and, and would, would listen to Paul. And, and so uh, he got to hear him and gave him some freedom, and uh, we... We don't have any record of Felix coming to Christ, but nonetheless, over these two years, Paul was able to, to talk with him over and over again about Jesus because he, he remained in that relationship. So those are just a few examples. There are many. There are many, many examples in Scripture of people um, coming to Christ as a result of relationships. So... But part of the challenge is, and I will be the first to tell you this, I know fewer and fewer non-Christians, unless I make an effort. It, it gets to be work. Because what happens? You start, you come to Christ, you start hanging out with church people. Next thing you know, you join the church league softball team. Start, you know, doing dinner with church people. And, you know, you, you end up doing, church can, can take over your life. The next thing you know, you don't even know your neighbors. I know I was convicted of that a couple of years ago. When, uh, was, there were some new neighbors moving in. And it occurred to me, you know, it's a military town. It occurred to me, I didn't even know the last neighbors. And so I just said, well, I'm going to go know these neighbors. And, uh, they might be watching this. And, you know, so they, 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 they could be. Okay, Matt and Julie, I'm praying for you. Uh, but uh, they're good people. But I'm glad that I got to know them. But it can be easy to completely be in that Christian bubble. So uh, how do you build evangelistic relationships? These are six pointers uh, that, have been, that Precept Ministries uh, puts out here. Uh, first of all, ask who do you know? 
You don't, you don't have to go. We all know people already. We work with them. We you know, send our kids to school with them. We do feedback with them. We, we run into them at, at recreation events. We, uh, I don't know, do, do Oz's CrossFit or classes or with them or, or, or whatever. Uh, is, is, to, is to start out by saying, who's around me? And then what do you know about them? You may know more than you think you know about them, or you may not know anything about them. But you know, what, what, how do you get to know people? Talk to them. You gotta talk to them. You gotta ask them. And I'm an introvert, so that's hard for me. That's work. But uh, you, start, you gotta spend time with them. You gotta get to know them, right? And this is you, you guys know this stuff. This is easy. And then start to pray for them, um, as we uh, as we mentioned couple weeks ago, it's important to just start praying for people, and, and you know, that's, that's, that's a privilege and an honor that I know that I've been able to have, is just to pray for people, and I pray for all of you guys daily, I look at this list and I pray for you guys, uh, and, and it's a real honor to be able to pray for people, and, and even for you, you know, get rough with names, it's like the, the lady who sits <laughs> third row over second bike back in my skipping class. I'm going to pray for her. It could be some, you know, God knows who they are and, and, and work on it and you'll know her name, you know. And then make connections. Uh, look for opportunities uh, to make connections. Uh, I, I realize the value of this uh, as a young pastor, again, in Selma, California, one of our trustees at the church had a great idea. He said, Pastor, I think it would be a good idea if our church joined the Chamber of Commerce. I said, what are you thinking? He's like, well, the last pastor just didn't know anybody. True that. So I joined the Chamber of Commerce. And that was, the, that was a great opportunity because you know, once a month they'd have these mixers and, and it'd be at different businesses. We actually hosted one once. It was the, only, it was the first alcohol-free <laughs> Chamber of Commerce and Mixer ever, ever. Um, but uh, what's that? Was it the best potluck? It was the best potluck ever. <laughs> Casseroles galore. Yes, we love carbs. They even brought the funeral type food, uh, so it was the good stuff. Uh, but uh, look for opportunities. Uh, you know, and the Air Force gives us a lot of good opportunities to, to make connections. You know, get involved in. I-6 or AFSA or CGOC or whatever, you know, there's a lot of good opportunities. And love them. I think people know when you love them. And, and I don't know about you, it, it, love, love, we, we don't love perfectly. But I think people know even in perfect love. I think they know that you're making the effort. Um, and love's not always warm and fuzzy. Uh, sometimes it is. It is sharing the word with them that no one else will. I know I'd, I'd a whole lot rather, if I'm, if I'm messing up, I'd a whole lot rather come by, somebody come alongside me and say, dude, you're messing up, <coughs> and have someone uh, give me a hug and just say, Jesus loves me, and, and not tell me I'm messing up. And then help them grow in Christ. And this is something, honestly, you can do even, you know, if maybe they don't love God, they hate God, then what do you do with God? You know what, just, the, the Bible's full of wisdom. Do you speak wisdom into their lives? I've shared this before. I read, I read a chapter of Proverbs every day. And part of that is I've found so much applicable in the book of Proverbs that it allows me to speak into the lives of those who don't love Christ. And then when they, where did you get that? Well, let me show you. Uh, and, and yet they're, they're starting, the word is going into them before they even know it. And so these are just some practical tips. Now, I have gone what, five sessions, doing like 98% of the talking. So, what I'd like for us to do is just to spend a few minutes now brainstorming either things we've seen or things we've done or things we've seen other people do to build relationships that have a kingdom impact. So what are some things you folks have seen or done? Go ahead. Turned one of my bedrooms into a barber shop and then cut hair for free. How about that? So I've cut 86, 87 heads of hair for 
free. Mm -hmm. um, and I've counseled numbers of people in my flight on issues they didn't have in marriage and a lot of other stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're making connections? Met you're, a lot of people. You're loving them. And you're getting opportunities to, to help them grow in Christ. And I learned how to cut hair. Too. And you're learning how to cut hair. So maybe a post Air Force career in that for you. One of those swirly things. Call you Floyd. That works. Anyone else? I volunteer here and other places. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Stepped out of my comfort zone. Really focused on that here. And it's, I know more people now in this time than I thought I could. A lot of people have come to Christ through this building over the years. And, you know, it is an unabashedly not, you know, non-faith specific facility, but it gets prayed over, and I really think that you know, we have a wholesome environment here. And come on, Goins, and if you, if you want to, if you feel like you need to pray for something, pray that Bill Goins gets another extension, because it's in a pack out right now, because, uh, I love Bill, and Bill's a man of God, too, but if Bill leaves, he's taking come on. <laughs> And, and that, that lady is irreplaceable. And she loves Jesus. So yeah, thank you for volunteering here because it makes a big difference. Others? Being my job. Just being a dentist when I was in school, I did mission trips. And, um, even though it was a Christian organization, the mission trips on, we have a lot of people that would go just to learn dental skills, not necessarily for the Christian aspect of it, but then people would convert on the trip just from seeing the things that were done, not just the dental care. So, I mean, you did learn the skills, and it was good, it was extra practice, but seeing the evangelizing part and how it affects people and other people coming to Christ, we have dentists on the trip that will come to Christ. Wow. So That's amazing. And that just keeps giving. I think we take for granted as Americans our access to dental care. And, uh, if you've ever had a really bad toothache, you need help. Good people walk miles on miles just to come see us. Wow. Care. So they get dental care and they get Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Others. There's a staff sergeant who's a believer in my building upstairs, and she uh, she constantly keeps like a large ready supply of Korean. Pastry snacks. <laughs> Talk about like, I mean, people just flock there. I don't know how she affords it, to be honest with you, but huh. she just keeps providing it. People just come, and when they when they get something to eat, it's free, so they naturally sit down. You know, I don't know if it's guilt or obligation, but they, they sit and they talk. <laughs> they spend usually 10, 15 minutes at a time mm -hmm. in there talking to her. So. Huh. Is it the, the staff sergeant that comes here? Yeah. It is? Well, she's been here once, yeah. Oh, she's Attended a couple times. Yeah. She wanted to be here. She's watching it. She said she's oh, watching she is? it. <laughs> well, yeah. Good on you. <laughs> All right. Others. Go ahead. Like you said, uh, over at Kunsan, there's a lot of people hurting. So a lot of times, uh, one way or another, it'll come across uh, our desks. And you, you have to think of creative solutions, uh, what they can do to better themselves. And a lot, of, a lot of it's uh, go to the chaplain, a lot of it's uh, go to the cell my den, go to a Sunday night meal uh, or services. So it's just pointing people in the right direction that are really uh, down. So being there just for people that are hurting. Right? Right. A lot of hurting people. They really are. Just being that, I'm here to listen. Absolutely. Others. There are all kinds of ideas, all kinds of ideas for ways we can uh, make relationships that will bring kingdom glory. Uh, and sometimes it does mean putting ourselves in awkward situations. I mentioned to you, I am an introvert, so sometimes just going to the you know, social events, I have to. I don't want to ask anybody to raise their hand if they feel the same way. 
I know some of you do. Uh, but you know, if you're not around people, you know, if you're in your room watching Netflix, you can't you can't get to know people. And so while I love me some Netflix, sometimes you know you've got to get out, you got to meet people. So I encourage you to consider thinking of that. So with that, we have one session left. But what your homework for the, uh, this week is, and we've talked about several ideas as far as building relationships. What I want you to do and, is to be intentional this week and pick an idea with the goal of building a relationship with someone who needs Jesus. Uh, it could be, you know, maybe going to lunch with them. It could be uh, cutting their hair. It could be uh, <laughs> giving them pastries. It could be if you know someone's hurting. Uh, you doing that. Uh, I think they already get free dental care, but it could be something else. Uh, you know, the, the, the sky's the limit, but really all I ask of you is think of someone. And, and as part of that, if you're recalling the list, you know, you want to pray for them uh, and be praying for them even now. And make that connection and love them and just take that opportunity uh, to get to, to know that person. That doesn't mean, you know, and, and here's where traditional evangelism tends to think, um, you know, I, by, the, by the end of lunch, i got I got to preach the gospel to them. Look, if, if they're open to the gospel, do it. But make it about building that relationship and loving them to Christ. I mean, at some point, of course, people have to hear the gospel. But that doesn't mean, you know, by the end of this 45-minute lunch, you know, <laughs> You know, just go to the bowling alley and you're on for it. Hey, slow roll that. <laughs> you know, get get my pibim bop to me a little bit slow because I need to make sure I'm, I need to make sure and lead this person to Christ. That's not what I'm encouraging you. I'm, I'm encouraging you to be a friend to them because as we saw, that's where the majority of people come to Christ. So we got one more session. I do urge you to uh, please catch up on YouTube. Uh, if you can do that, because I will be doing a post-test at the end. It, it looks a lot like the pre-test. In fact, it's the same. But the goal <laughs> is, is to measure if there's been a change. Um, and, when, and next week we're going to focus a little bit on the workplace, what the do's and don'ts are. And then there's going to be an epilogue in there that uh, will show it put into practice in the Scripture. And also, uh, one other thing that I'd like to invite some of you to consider, and this is one of those things that, you know, at the end of the seminar, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to give you the post-test. I'm going to want to sit down with some of you and kind of interview you about your perspective as, as a Christian airman in the Air Force, your experience. Um, all these surveys, by the way, your names won't end up in, in anything printed, so there's no worry there. But I would like to, as a second portion of this, uh, form a mentoring relationship with some of you. And, and what you would be on the hook for is we'd probably meet together about six times and just talk more in depth on this stuff. So uh, I'd like to invite you to be praying about that. Okay? So any final thoughts? Thank you, folks. I'm going to close this in prayer. God, we thank you that you are a relational God, that you reach out to us. And we thank you that the gospel is relational. And that it makes a connection between the lives of those who practice it and uh, the Savior uh, who died for us. And so, God, I pray for each and every one of these men and women here that you will help us to form meaningful friendships with people. Uh, not just so we can have more friends, but so that we can have a kingdom impact. I pray for those that we're going to reach out to this week. And pray that you'll be at work in their lives uh, already uh, with your Holy Spirit softening their hearts paving the way for their salvation. In Jesus' name.